Hello and welcome to episode 24 of The Final Whistle. On this week's episode, we'll be talking about the NBA. We're going into the finals now and also some question marks in the beginning of NFL OTAs. So first up, the NBA. There was just a huge comeback from the Celtics. They were down 3-0 in the Eastern Conference Finals. They came back, tied it 3-3, and they get the home game in Boston, and they fall to the Heat. It was never really a close game, and the Heat almost looked like they were toying with them by letting them get those three games. I mean, the Celtics, I mean, I picked the Celtics but earlier, but I just think it's it's crazy how I was. we were watching the game, the game seven, uh, they put up a stat on the bottom of the screen how they shot like four for like 57 from three-point land, the Celtics. And I thought it was just ridiculous because if you're watching the first two quarters, their offense was, was actually dominant. They just couldn't hit a shot. Like they kept throwing it to Al Herford in the paint and he would just kick it out for an open three, but they obviously wouldn't fall in. I mean, they also had trouble because Jason Tatum uh, hurt his ankle in like literally the first play of the game. I mean, would it have made a difference? Uh, I don't know because he still – I thought he still played well even though obviously it wasn't a full go, you know. People were probably clowning him saying it was an excuse, but I mean if you looked at it if you looked at him like fall, like you could tell like I think if anybody felt like that they would know the pain. But I think the heat the heat can just shoot. Like if if they were, if they were to switch teams and they like the Heat ran the Celtics playbook, like they probably would have blew him out in the first quarter. You know, it's good that the Heat don't have to rely on Jimmy Butler since they're their roster is so deep with the shooters. Yeah, the Heat's roster, they, like, no top picks on their roster. A lot is homegrown. Jimmy Butler's not their star player, but a lot of undrafted free agents, late picks in the draft, and they mesh well as a team, and they've been playing great. And Jalen Brown in that Game 7, he was getting clowned for his performance. In Game 7, their second star, he did not, he was not clutch at all in Jason Tatum's absence, and they that's why they lost about by 20 points but also in that game six it was wild game Derek White hits that shot with about 0.1 seconds left on the rebound from Marcus Smart's go ahead three and that was just a crazy game and I thought after that the Celtics were definitely going to win the series but he still came out on top yeah I remember watching that moment I was with my friends my friends are a lot of my friends are diehard heat fans I, was, I, I saw it go in and I jumped off and they were jumping too I'm like why are you guys jumping you know and they thought I didn't go in because but it was very close, and I looked at it, went in. I'm like, Derek. I mean, I don't even know who Derek White was, to be honest with you. And then, that, and then that bang, game seventy starts. But like, I, I had no idea who this guy was, and he just tipped it in. Like, that's that's what hustle does for you. You always hustle, and that's what happens. You know, you don't you play until like the final whistle. And that's exactly what they did there. And that's so I think that's the reason why they obviously had that happen because they tr- they were they tried their hardest, and good things happen when you try hard. Well, nonetheless, they still lost in Game 7, and now we have a matchup between the 8 seed coming out of the Eastern Conference, the Heat, and the 1 seed out of the West, the Denver Nuggets. So who do you got in that? I have the Nuggets, man. I mean, they're well, they're too well-rested right now to come out and lose the, one of the first two games. I think they're going to take a 2-0 lead, and they might lose the third game. But I think the series is going to be over in like five or six games. I think the Nuggets are just going to dominate them. I think this is one of the best duos we've seen in the playoffs since, like, Kobe Shaq, if you want to be completely honest. Because, you know, you got 30 from Murray, but then you have – like they it's like they play, re- like, reverse rules. Like, Jokic is the one getting the rebounds, assists, and points, and then you have the point guard who's just putting up the points. You know what I mean? It's usually reverse – usually a point guard does the passing and the rebounding more. But I think it's going to be pretty hard for the Heat to guard Jokic. I mean, like, he, bro just puts up shots, like, over his head, and he, it just goes in. Like, I mean, Bam's going to put up a good fight. He does play really good defense. But I, it's really hard. It's like really hard to guard him. But I could totally see the Heat making like a, a push because you know, in my opinion, I think Caleb Caleb Martin should have won the MVP. I don't think Jimmy Buckets deserved it. I mean, I didn't think he played that well. But like, I mean, Caleb was like, he was just automatic every game. Missed like five to six shots every game. And I mean, I don't know how you don't give that to the MVP. But I don't know. Things be really tough for the Heat to come yeah, out and win. Jimmy Butler won the Larry Bird Trophy, the now what's now called the Eastern Conference MVP. He had 24.7 points, 7.6 rebounds, 6.1 assists, and 2.6 steals averaged in that series. And I've also got to pick the Nuggets in this series in the finals. And you said the Nuggets are well rested. I think that could help and hurt because the Heat they've been playing games. They been in the atmosphere of the playoffs and I saw that the Nuggets elevation I don't know how big of a factor this will make 5,280 feet and in Miami it's about only six feet so the oxygen could get it could get hard to breathe in there for the heat and the Nuggets have been used to it all season not much having how much of an impact that'll have but we'll see 
we'll see if the Heat complain about it or what. So <laughs> let's just see what happens now. And now we're going to take a short break, and John will join me to talk about the NFL OTAs. Welcome back. So now John has joined me, and Sports Illustrated put out an article, the seven biggest questions and storylines coming out of NFL OTAs that just started. So the first question is the 49ers and their quarterback situation. They've got three guys competing for that job, and it's really complicated. So who do you think can win it, and why is it so complicated? Yeah, so a very uh, tricky room they got in San Francisco. They got their third overall pick from two years ago, Trey Lance, who looked promising in college, and they were very high on him, but he came out and he got hurt versus Seattle in the week two of last year. And then they uh, put in Brock Purdy towards the end of the season this year and they brought them to the NFC Championship game. So that's already two quarterbacks. And then they signed Sam Darnold. Kyle Shanahan was sitting here saying in press conferences that Sam Darnold might have the best arm talent he's ever had as, with a quarterback. So that's three guys that you have in training camp now, all potentially with that, that are fighting for that QB1 spot. So the 49ers have a lot of uh, hard decisions to make because the 49ers aren't really a team to even keep three quarterbacks on the roster when it comes – August and you have to make the cuts so one of these guys are going to go and one of these guys is going to sit the bench so it's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah they could definitely make a deal a trade for somebody and we'll just have to see who's the odd one out I think that's obviously a big question also mm -hmm. and Brock Purdy Mr. Irrelevant in the draft and I don't think that really matters we saw that with Tom Brady I'm not saying he's Tom Brady but he obviously had a great run in the playoffs he made it to the conference championship and he's a little bit banged up also but I think his arm will be fine, ready for the season, and he'll be ready to go, and I think he should be the starting quarterback. And second question, what do the Browns really think of their offense? Another confusing team. They just got Deshaun mm -hmm. Watson back halfway through last year about, and it seemed like their team got worse with him. He didn't play football in a while, but what do you think about them this year? It was almost like the Browns last year were better with Brissett than they were with Watson because when Watson came in, they just really kind of – like, the Browns were a fun team to watch with Brissett, and then when Brissett was benched for Watson, obviously, because he came out of suspension, the team just kind of looked worse, and Watson did not look good because he hadn't played football in so long. He wasn't even able to practice with the team for all those weeks. So I think that the Browns will definitely improve this offseason just because Deshaun Watson's able to be at OTAs with the team. He's able to build the chemistry with his receivers and his tight ends and his off offensive linemen in the offseason that you need. He wasn't able to do that last offseason. So you add that with the acquisition of Elijah Moore. You add Marquise Goodwin. And then you already add the offense with Nick Chubb and Amari Cooper. The Browns could they can make some noise in that division this year. Yeah, that's a tough division, obviously, but you mentioned Elijah Moore. I think that was a good under-the-radar move, and he was good on the Jets a few years back, and I think he could get back to that form of himself. Mm -hmm. And the third question, the Vikings secondary, they have been one of the worst defenses like in recent years, and they just did get, bring in Brian Flores for their defensive coordinator, and I think that will help a lot. Very good defensive-minded coach. Yeah, the Vikings, they really uh, – I mean – Brian Flores should be a head coach in this league. He shouldn't really. Uh, I don't really know why he's uh, just a defensive coordinator, but the Vikings have a very good defensive coordinator now. So I think that you'll see that defense change maybe with Brian Flores there, and uh, you'll see them improve. Yeah, their cornerbacks have been very weak over the past few years, and they just lost Patrick Peterson, an older guy, but definitely a good veteran cornerback to have on your team. And now the next question with the Giants, they brought in a huge, big acquisition for them. A tight end who they haven't had a, in a while since it seems like Jeremy Shockey, maybe. And Darren Waller, he's almost like a receiver. He's like 6'5". He can run fast. He can, he can do everything. He can run routes. And I think that'll be huge for Daniel Jones. And that's somebody for him to lean on. I think he hasn't really had in his career. Yeah, if everything goes right and Darren Waller comes in there and plays – Daniel Jones' his numbers are going to skyrocket because Darren Waller is just one of those players. He's a tight end. He's huge, but he plays like a wide receiver. That's if he can stay on the field, though. Darren Waller has had a lot of issues with staying on the field. He's been get, he, The past two seasons, he's basically been hurt. That's probably why you were able to trade for him for pretty cheap for a high-caliber tight end. So, But if you're able to keep him on the field, Darren Waller is a top-three tight end in the, in the NFL. Yeah, he's obviously, like I said, huge for the Giants. And with Brian Dable there, he'll be able to build around him and make plays for him. 
And the Texans, they're, they can look like an exciting team this year. They brought in C.J. Stroud in the draft. They traded back up for the next pick and got Will Anderson. And they've also got a guy returning. He had cancer, John Michi III, and he's a top receiver. Mm -hmm. He was great in college. And how do you think they're looking going into the year? Another Texans receiver that people are sleeping on is a kid they got in the third round, Tank Dell. I think that they got him from Houston. That's another receiver that's going to be very good for Houston. I think that they did a very good job in this draft, but, I mean, it's still just – it's a very young team. There's still a lot of holes on that roster. They're not going to be pushing for a playoff spot, but who knows? They can be a team that makes some noise and, you know, uh, beat some teams in the end of the season and kick them out of the playoffs. And, I mean, they got C.J. Stroud in there. They got Will Anderson. They got arguably the best quarterback in defensive end in the draft. So the Texans, obviously, they're building something there. Yeah, I think they've also got a good coach who came from the 49ers, defensive coordinator. It seems like all of their defensive coordinators end up becoming head coaches. Mm -hmm. And D'Amico Ryans, who was a middle linebacker for mm -hmm. the Texans, is now their head coach. And now the second to last question, the Dolphins' backfield. It was confusing last year. It'll be confusing this year with Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson, Miles Gaskin, and also a question mark with Tua if he'll be able to stay on the field. And that's that's the great thing about running back is that you don't really need a true starter. You can just have a committee of guys that go in there, and I mean, when, when, if you have three good running backs, you can just run all over teams. And you kind of, but the team that runs the ball better controls the game. It's just the way it's the way football works. And the 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 team with the best running game, there's just there's nine times out of ten they're going to win the game. So if you have three running backs that could go out there and do it for you, then I mean. You're in a great spot. Yeah, more running backs can't hurt. And the last question we're going to go over, DeAndre Hopkins. He got released from the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. They're eating a lot of money there, and they couldn't get anything from him, it seems like, in trade value, which is a little bit confusing to me. I thought they would be able to get something, especially before the draft, but they ended up not trading him. And what team do you think he's going to go to? He has a very, uh, uh, you know, bad situation for the Cardinals, not being able to get anything for him. But, I mean, who knows where DeAndre Hopkins can go. I think he'll – probably end up going to a team with uh you know chiefs bill somewhere because i bet he wants to compete for a ring now you know he deserves it going on to his third team now i think you'll see him go to a team like the chiefs or the bills or someone for maybe a little bit less money than you'd imagine deandre hopkins would play for yeah i think he does want to win win a ring he's going to play for one of the top quarterbacks in the league and i wouldn't count out the dallas cowboys they could definitely use a receiver and they could go a long way, even though I hate to say it. I hope yeah. he does not go there. I think he'll go to the Chiefs or the Bills probably also, though. One of those top teams who could always use another receiver. And that's going to do it for us on episode 24. We'll see you next week for episode 25.